listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. Welcome to another edition of the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v I'm your host, Femi Abebefe. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos, as always. And Michael, it's been an extended weekend for most folks. Obviously, Memorial Day weekend, a time that we can spend with our loved ones and people that we like and everything, but also a time to reflect on the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice in helping defend our country and and, and make sure that we can still have freedoms here in America. So it's, I think we should start off with just like reflecting and, and acknowledging that here before we get into all the football talk. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's so important. I mean, it's beyond the picnics. You know, as a kid, you used to love to put on your Little League uniform and get in the parade and go play your first Little League baseball game of the summer, which was awesome. But I think it's a bigger issue. And I we stumbled across this at the Daily Coach about a story uh, by David Blight, who wrote a book called Race and Reunion. He's a historian. uh, He's a professor at Yale. And he talks about a situation in Charleston, South Carolina, that really was the the start of Memorial Day. We called it Decoration Day. And he was researching at the Harvard Library, the Hofton Library up at Harvard, and he was going through a bunch of boxes, and he found one that said Decoration Day, and he stumbles across a letter on a cardboard piece of paper and a news article about all about what occurred in Charleston after the Civil War and how they were going to how they could handle what occurred at this racetrack, uh, uh, the planters, it was the Washington Jockey Club or something. So they had this racetrack in Charleston that they basically made an open air prison union. They had 260 union uh, soldiers died on at that racetrack because of the conditions, the brutality of the conditions and the weather. And so, you know, once the, once this was over, uh, the former slaves, uh, whites and blacks got together and and held a ceremony led by all the former black slaves and their children as they marched through and they had a ceremony they had a picnic and they built an arch way to basically honor the dead there and so to me that's kind of it's a great story about coming together it's a great story about honoring the fallen and it's a great story about why we celebrate memorial day yeah, no, it definitely is. It's like we, we obviously don't do it enough probably as our country with everyone who's been able to protect and serve. And we obviously thank those of you who are still with us, veterans and everything, who protect and serve because it's something that we can easily take for granted because we don't have to think about it. But there's a reason why we don't have to think about those things because of the men and women who have uh, been in the armed forces and have helped instill the freedoms that we have here in this country till this day. So wanted to give a shout out to all of them and obviously remember those who uh, made the ultimate sacrifice and our fallen soldiers who are no longer with us. But let's get into the football now, Michael, because we're actually yep. at the halfway point of the off season. So we are now, I believe the, the mark is officially uh, more days have passed since Super Bowl 57 Chiefs beating the Eagles than are left before the kickoff. Lions Chiefs opening night September seventh. So it's a it's a big momentous occasion here in the offseason. Now that we're we're halfway yeah, through I, this thing, man. I don't we're, count we're, I don't count the, the start of the season when the games happen. I mean the preseason yeah. is so much fun, you know, and the you know and looking at the teams in the summer and go to me the smell of grass, you know, the boys mm-hmm. of fall by Kenny Chesney. That 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 element of the summer is the best. I mean. July 15th, your body, if you're in the league or even if you're not in the league, your body is now drawn to, okay, I got to go to camp. Like, I've had enough time off. I'm rested. I got to go to camp. And to me, that's the start of it. I know some people don't don't equate that. They're waiting on the games. But to me, the, the, the summer is so good. And to be able to experience that is is what I love the most. Yeah, and we're getting close to it. I mean, we're less than two months away from training camps starting, which is kind of crazy to even think because it feels like we've been talking about these stories all the time, and it's like, okay, like OTAs are going on, but training camp is right around the corner, Hall of Fame game, that'll be going on in Canton, Ohio, and that's kind of like the official kickoff of everything here for us in the NFL. But I know one team, particularly here in Las Vegas where I'm sitting, the folks are just going absolutely crazy. With this Jimmy Garoppolo news, the report came out earlier last week that he had another surgery on his foot right after signing with the Las Vegas Raiders. <laughs> now more has come out about the injury waiver and the contract and how if the Raiders wanted to could could get off the contract without really any repercussions if there's something that comes up with the foot. I believe it's the second metatarsal to give a doctor term in that left foot for Jimmy Garoppolo. 
what exactly is going on? And can you set the record straight here? Because people are freaking out about, is he going to be our quarterback? What are we going to do at QB if we don't have Garoppolo to start the season? I think a lot of the time stories get manipulated by people that don't understand the National Football League or have never worked in the National Football League. And so they take a, a story and they blow it out of proportion. You know, I, I, I'm not anyone special, but I spent 35 years in the National Football League. I did a lot of contracts. And I would say in 70% of those contracts that I did, there was an injury waiver of some sort, especially on a veteran player. Why is that? Because when you're a player in the league, you certainly have conditions that have magnified themselves over the time. And so when you come in for a physical, like Jimmy Garoppolo comes into Las Vegas for a physical, everybody's expecting a press conference, right? Okay, he went, took his physical. They saw that the second metatarsal wasn't healing properly on its own. So now they got a problem. How do we handle this problem? If we assume the liability of this injury, then... That's all. That's our. We can't do that. We can't put our owner in that position, and the agent knows that. And so the goal is to get it fixed correctly. But the secondary goal is to make sure the team's protected in case something catastrophic happens. This is like insurance. This is like buying insurance. You hope you never need to use it, but if it's there, it's there. And so to me, what they decided was, and this is why it took a little bit of time to get that press conference going, was because they said, okay, what's our course of action? What are we going to do? We're going to repair this. We're going to put a screw in it so it never happens again. The agent is amicable to agreeing to sign an injury waiver, which is very common, very common in a 1,000 contracts. Very common. Very common. They signed an injury waiver on the specific injury. Does this mean if he breaks his arm, they could cut him? No. It's only specifically around the second metatarsal. This is very common, okay? I keep repeating this. All right, yep. so now they know that that's what they want to do, and now they plan the course of action. Okay, we're going to have the operation done. You're going to be in a boot. You're going to be in the building. Boom, 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 and we move forward. And I think anybody who makes more of that than what it really is doesn't understand the National Football League. Garoppolo is expected to be their quarterback, and unless something catastrophic happens with his foot, He will be the quarterback. And all this conversation that we're having in May on Memorial Day will be looked at as, oh, that was just for clicks. Yeah. I mean, this is the... The, the, the desert time of the content sphere for the NFL. So you, it, it, w- it wouldn't be surprising for somebody to blow something out of proportion just to, to get something like this. And I'm not accusing anybody of being nefarious in doing it, but it happens in, in this time of the off season. I, I do think the reason why this in particular though, has blown up to what it is right now, at least on the outside, on the inside, it's probably just, Hey, business as usual, but on the outside, it has blown up because of Garoppolo's history with injuries. Don't you think that kind of also is factoring in as well? Cause people say, Oh my gosh, They have this injury waiver for a guy who has trouble playing a full season. Well, I I think that's two separate issues. The waiver is only on the second metatarsal. The fact that Garoppolo could get hurt is a concern for everyone, everyone who's a fan of Garoppolo beyond the second metatarsal. That's when you signed him, you said to yourself, I'm worried about him getting hurt. I mean, you're holding your breath because you know durability isn't one of his strengths. Those are two separate issues. I mean, those are two separate issues. This is a waiver on his fifth, on his second metatarsal. That will heal. They put a screw in it. That will heal. Now, can he stay healthy somewhere else? That's a concern. That's always what you're going to be concerned about as a Raider fan. But to me, you're making, you're trying to lump two and two together and get four when they're two separate issues. And again, I'm not defending the Raiders because my sons work there. I'm defending what typically happens in the National Football League. Waivers are very commonplace. They're on a lot of injuries, especially when they're, it's an injury that you don't want to accept that's not healed. So you don't want to take it out. You can't put your owner in that position. And so the waiver language is often tailored around one specific injury. Now, if he were to break his fifth metatarsal, it may not apply. And that's usually what happens when you get into grievances. Sometimes when you have waivers on players, you specifically cite this part, part of the body, and then he hurts something similar around it. And, you're, and the club says, no, 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 we have a waiver on that. And the player says, no, 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 that's just for this. And then you got to go to a grievance. That's the problem. So, look, the, the fact is Brady's lingering out there, right? Brady's yep. part owner of the team now, you know, and everybody thinks Brady could come back. And I think people don't understand that Brady, you know, is still involved in trying to get his life in order with his children in Miami. It's the reason he's not doing Fox. 
You know, he, he's got to be home two weeks out of every month, and it's important to him. I, I mean, I know the Brady stories. Every injury that occurs, it's going to come back Brady. to Brady. I mean, look, we're still talking about bringing Phillip Rivers back last year. Yeah, and he's a high school football coach. Hopefully he's doing well. Right, Phillip and Andrew Rivers, Luck. Yeah. I mean, you know, Washington made a phone call on Andrew Luck that, that created a stir about tampering, which obviously the, the league said it didn't happen. Who knows what the league investigated? I mean, I'm sure they're part of the Warren Commission too, but, but you know, that group there. But I, I think to me, every time there's a guy out there, it doesn't mean he's coming back. If you're a Raider fan, stop worrying about the foot. Worry about Garoppolo staying healthy. That's your concern. Do you think that they would at some point this offseason go back and tweak the finances of the contract? Because I know there was like that they added no. that language in there and all that. But you think no, everything is they, good with like they negotiated it. They did this. You're looking at it through today's lens. This was already done four months ago. It just happened to break today. And so you're looking at it through like this is this is just current news. This is old news. This is old news that's being hashed up. They negotiated this. They both agreed, Don Yee. And and his uh, Garoppolo's agent and the Raiders agreed this was the best course of action, and it all happened because they he couldn't pass the physical, so they came up with a well, they came up, and the part that makes it really understandable nobody's trying to screw the other party, mm-hmm. they're they're working together to get to a common goal, which is to get him on the field and to play. Well, we'll see if he can get on the field. I mean, everything sounds like it's still on track for training camp, right? For Jimmy Garoppolo. Like we should see him yeah, once training I mean, camp opens as a quarterback. Okay. That's why they put the plan together back when they signed him. They understood what it is, you know, and, and he'll move mm-hmm. forward. And so like we 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 look at things through a lens of of the present and we go back and it's like we have all the information. Like nobody who's reporting this has ever seen any of the medical. They just see the waiver. Like if if you understand the medical, you'll understand what they're doing. All right. And as long as they're working together like they are right now, it's probably a nothing burger that on Memorial Day weekend, we blow up out of proportion because it's Jimmy Garoppolo. And also there's the chance that something crazy could happen. But it doesn't sound like anything is going to be happening here with the Raiders. Raiders fans, take a deep sigh of relief. Garoppolo will be your quarterback moving forward here to start the NFL regular season. On the other side, we're going to try to find a landing spot for the former all pro wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and VSIN. Here is Femi Abebefe. All right, we figured this was probably going to happen at some point this offseason, some kind of a split between wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins and the Arizona Cardinals. Initially, they were trying to shop him for a trade to see if there were any interested parties out there that would want to take on Hopkins' services, but the contract probably a little bit too much for people to bring on. So earlier last week, the Raiders went ahead and sorry, the Raiders, the Cardinals went ahead and decided to release the three time all pro wide receiver turns 31 next week. Michael, I don't know what kind of market is out there for him, but this feels like this was probably the right move for Arizona as they try to move forward with the rebuild. Uh, I mean, I'd like to hear your commentary with your client when he had his, when he released his demands for (laughs) what he's looking for in the next quarterback. Did you read those, Femi? I mean, I, I know he said a lot of positive things about your client, Kyler Murray, but he also said he wants to go to a team that's quarterbacks all in, that quarterbacks have all about winning in the team. You know, and you could say, well, that's just, you know, that that's just kind of what – no, 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 no. There's a reason a guy says that. And let's be clear here. There's a lot of political answers that are given. You know, Joel <laughs> Embiid endorses Doc Rivers. Okay, did he? I don't know. Did he really mean that? I don't know. But publicly, that's what he meant. Do you believe it? Maybe you do. Maybe you don't. I don't know. People say things to the media so that they're not the bad guy. You know, that they don't so, want to be the bad guy. But you gotta, you got to intertwine a little bit in this. I love to hear you with your defense. Put your white hair on and defend that. <laughs> So let's lay it out here. So Hopkins in the podcast, he was on I Am Athlete with Brandon Marshall and those guys and talking about how what he would want in his next team. So here were not demands, but here's what he's looking for. And it's three things. Quarterback that loves the game and brings everyone on board with him. A great defense because defense wins championships. Got to have a great D line is what he said. And then stable management because he says he's been through four general managers in his career. Let's go back to that quarterback part because that's the one that we're on the sticking point as it pertains to one Kyler Murray. Kyler Murray, the face of the franchise for the Arizona Cardinals, signing that big extension. 
I think this could, if you wanted to, because we talk about how you can look at it either way. It's the Rorschach test, you know, glass half full, glass half empty. If you wanted to, you could say that this is a shot at Kyler Murray. The way I see it and the way I read it is that this is just what he wants as a 31, almost 31 year old wide receiver on his next team because he wants to win a championship. So, mm-hmm. yes, he may not have a 100% leader for a quarterback in his last destination, but he wants that going forward here. And it doesn't have to be a shot at Kyler Murray. That just he wants to go ahead and win at the end of his career. Okay. I, I mean, that's on the surface, I would say, okay. But you know that they had to put a clause in Kyler Murray's contract to get him to work hard, to get him to study yeah. and prepare. It took so, it out. <laughs> it went in. There's a reason it went in, and there's a reason he's saying what he's saying, which backs up the reason it went in. Look, this, as Occam Razor says, the simplest solution is the easiest one. It's not too hard to connect those dots if you're looking at it honestly, if you're not trying to make excuses for the kid, you know, if you're honestly looking at it. And I'll take this a step further. I think yeah. they got rid of Hopkins because they're trying to recreate their culture. I've said this all along. When they traded Hopkins from Houston, everybody, oh, my God, they got nothing for him. There were a lot of people that didn't want to get her into that market. They just didn't trade him there because they had no market. That was the best market they could come up with. And then they went ahead and the Arizona Cardinals paid him, I think they paid him $57 million for three years, over three years. Mm-hmm. And what have yep. they gotten out of it? What have they gotten out of it, right? And now they're just letting them go and eating 21. They're going to eat 20, almost $22 million of salary cat debt just to let them go. Now, my next question to you is, they're going to be horrible. We get that. Yeah. They're going to have the, they're probably have a good chance to have the first or second pick in the draft. And they got Houston's pick. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you can keep kidding yourself that Kyler's the greatest, Kyler's the greatest. But at some point, people that know what they're seeing on tape and what he does in the locker room, somebody's going to say, look, we could get Caleb Williams, and he's a top five leader, he's a top five player, and we can get rid of Murray. I think that's where we're headed. I think that conversation is for sure going to be had, but then I'll also push back and say the the next year quarterback always looks a little bit more attractive when we're not in that draft process. Like a lot of people have a lot of stuff to say about, oh, ne- wait till next year's quarterback class. What if Caleb Williams struggles this season? But like, that's a lot Drake of people. That's not people that have expertise on yeah. quarterbacks. That That's Mel Kuyper and Todd McShay you're, you're citing here. That's not people that study quarterbacks in the league. Like, if you study Caleb Williams in the league and you watch his game and you understand what it takes to play, you know, what he did last year is pretty damn impressive. And if he fell off the cliff, it would be shocking. To me, the real fundamental issue is here is do you want to build a team around a guy who who doesn't really endear himself with his teammates? Is that who you want to set your culture with? They're getting rid of Hopkins for a reason. Don't kid yourself. They're getting rid of Hopkins for a reason. They don't want to pay $19 million to somebody who they think will affect their culture. I think by the next time, they're going to realize that Mary, unless Michael Bidwell steps in and says, no, 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 you can't get rid of him. He's my, he's my guy. But what, isn't it also getting rid of Hopkins with the timeline of DeAndre Hopkins? I mean, because you have a new general manager. You have a new head coach. This team is pretty far away from winning. He's 31 years old now. This is the only time that you could probably even try to get rid of him, and they even couldn't do that. They had to cut him and take all that money, and they decided not even to make it a June 1 cut. I feel like even if Hopkins was the A-plus character guy, I still think they would have tried to trade him just because he, oh, they his timeline kept him, Femi. doesn't they really would have match kept, him. If he's an A-plus character to, to guy, they keep him. To, to do to, what, to keep playing. I mean, win? oh, like, Femi, you've got to stop the SNBA notion. Like, teams are trying to win. <laughs> Like you no, gotta stop are. that. Nobody is nobody wants to get rid of a good player who's a good guy. But we you want to build your reality. team around him. If you don't understand anything about team building, you want to build your team around somebody who's a good guy. If we're paying him nineteen million and nineteen and change, and he's a great kid and he produces, I'm not getting rid of him. Why would I get rid of him? They never got rid of Larry Fitzgerald when they sucked. Why would they get rid of him? You're not gonna win. That's why. And you, it doesn't I mean, matter. You, your job is to put the best players on the field that you can that fit your culture. You could say you're never going to win. That's easy. So you get rid of all your good players because you're never going to win. I mean, you're back into the process mentality. I no, mean, you, you're no. right. You're, you get sucked right back into it. Oh, let's lose no, and get draft no. picks. You, no, you Stop. are because you're saying get rid of a culture guy to, to, to do that. You can't do that. He's not what a culture guy. That's why you're getting rid of him. Yeah. 
of course. But what I'm saying is that when you have a certain timeline, him at 31 is not going to help you win. He's going to help you build but a culture. But if he's a great and guy, he, down to everyone else. No, 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 Femi. Because if he's a great guy and he's a character guy, he does help you win. He shows the younger players how to be pros. He shows them how to win, how to be a professional. You can't get rid of that. You're dying for that. You want veteran great players who have that sense to put them in your locker room. That's what you want. Why would I get rid of that? Just because I'm, I'm, I'm going to have a shitty year? Okay, bring Sam Henke in. Let's let him start fucking drafting. Let's get him start the process here. Like, you got to have people around you that are good players that understand what it takes. If they don't, if they are probably maligning the team, if they're in the group of three, right? There's three groups of people on every team. Group one will do anything. Group two is undecided. Group three are right? If you're in group three, I'm yeah. getting rid of you. If you're in group one, I'm keeping you. Yeah, well, I, the, the reason why I said that you could sell high on him is because if he was a plus character, you could probably get a day one, day two pick for him. And that's and I, I think it's valuable for a team that is starting a rebuild and doesn't want to pay that money. That's why I think you could I go think down that's that a path. better point. I mean, if if I could get a two number one, if I'm at the Rams and I can get a bunch of picks for Aaron Donald, I got to mm -hmm. consider that because he's he's an asset. I am trading assets for more assets. I'm trading here. Yeah. I get that. I get that. But if I yeah. can't get anything for him, that yeah, tells me yeah, he's yeah. a can't. I got to get rid of him. But yeah. if I could yeah. get something, but I couldn't get what I wanted, right? I can't mm -hmm. quite get there. I can't. You know, he's worth way more than that. Why would I just give mm -hmm. him away? Because there, there is a value to team building. There's a value to all that. Yeah, no, I, I think we're on the same page. I think we've we, we've reached the same page here of what we're doing. But like, like, I'm not saying just to give him away for a ham sandwich if he was an A plus character guy. No, that's not the the deal here. You want to get something of value in return because, like you said, every player has a price. Whether it's Aaron Donald, DeAndre Hopkins, or whoever, every player has a price, and you always have to entertain that stuff. With that said, uh, Hopkins wants to go to these contending teams. Where do you think is the best fit for him to go? I mean, I think Buffalo, you know, we Elliot asked me to put together a list of teams that really didn't, you know, what their off season is like. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, when we grade these off seasons, I think it's a little bit wrong. You know, I think I think part of being an NFL team is you've got to get your former team better, right? You got to get some of these young players that you currently have on your team to play at a higher level. And so everybody focuses on the new and they don't focus on the old. And if you're Buffalo, you know, you could really use a slot. I mean, Buffalo and Kansas City were engaged in trade conversations. He makes $19.4 million. As I've said on this pod before, once your boy Beckham got that contract, Hopkins is like, well, I'm better than Beckham. How come I got to take less money? You know, so I think that's a sticking point. Now, I don't know what he's going to get. Will Cleveland come in involved? They've got cap room. I mean, everybody wants Philly to put him on there and put him on their team. But I think Philly's too smart to put all that money in a one-year player. That's cap money you're giving to a one-year guy that you can't get back, that you could, sign vet you could sign some younger players too. See, cap room and cap assets are as critical as the player. I think in Buffalo's case, you know, you put him inside with Diggs on the outside and you've got Kennard, you've got Kennard, uh, uh, I mean, Kincaid, the, the Dalton Kincaid, Kincaid yeah. the kid they drafted. You got Dawson Knox. You know, and now all of a sudden, Gabe Davis is an auxiliary. I think that makes sense. Same thing with Kansas City. He can replace Juju Smith-Schuster. Look, the one thing about Hopkins is he's always covered. I mean, you can say whatever you want about Hopkins. He's always covered. But he's an incredible eye-hand coordination, and he's a great jump ball receiver. And so that's why he makes plays. It isn't because he separates. It's because he's got great ability to push off. He's got – really, if you study Hopkins, balance is what his greatest strength is. His ability to stay in balance and catch the ball. So – what kind of a contract do you think he gets? Like, do you think he ultimately gets that Beckham money or does he have to take a little bit of a cut? Well, I mean, Beckham did a seven year contract that voids to one. I think he'll get, you know, I think he'll get probably 10 to 12 on a one year deal. That looks like a five year deal. I mean, I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing, yeah. but the, you know, right now it's not the time to be a free agent looking for money. No, nobody has no. any, nobody wants to pay any money. Everybody's going to the Super Bowl. Everybody's buzz light years ahead of last year. <laughs> That fourth round wide receiver is going to really pop, so we don't need to go ahead and he's sign He's the DeAndre best player Hopkins. we have. We couldn't believe he's there. <laughs> that 
it's it's a, it's wonderful how these teams talk themselves into these players there. But DeAndre Hopkins now on the open market, presumably going to a contending team. We'll see who he ends up signing with later on this offseason. On the other side, let's talk about a guy we haven't spoke about much this offseason. That's one Brock Purdy and the Niners QB situation. We'll discuss that next year on the GM. You're listening to the GM Shuffle with Michael Lombardi, presented by DraftKings and v Here is Femi Abebefe. Another offseason and another time period where we're wondering who's going to play quarterback for the 49ers in week number one. Brock Purdy is the guy who has the inside track, according to John Lynch, the general manager, and Kyle Shanahan, the head coach. However, he is recovering from that elbow injury he suffered in the NFC title game against the Philadelphia Eagles, thus prompting the Niners to sign Sam Darnold as an insurance clause. And also they have a quarterback on the roster who was a third overall pick that we've only seen play four games. But I digress. Purdy. Shanahan recently came out and said that they expect him to start throwing next week. Now, I'm sure it's going to be some sort of a soft toss thing here, Michael. Not going to be all the way ramped up until maybe training camp at the absolute earliest. But do you think that there are signs pointing in the right direction that Purdy could ultimately be the week one starter for the Niners despite the elbow injury? I mean, if he starts throwing now, whether it's softball throws or not, you got to expect him to be ready to go for camp. And I'm sure he'll be on some form of pitch count for camp. Mm-hmm. You know, and, uh, you know, let him do that. But I think if they're saying those things, right, you know, if, they're, if they believe that, they have four quarterbacks on the roster. Remember, they signed it, Brandon Allen as also. So yeah. that gives them – they'll probably bring Purdy into camp. They'll PUP Purdy, meaning physically unable to perform, which puts him on a reserve list. So he can't really throw – he'll be like what Garoppolo was last year off on a side field. And then once they feel like, okay, he can start doing everything – They'll pass him on the physical. They'll put him out there, and they'll limit his throws. And when with four quarterbacks, they'll have enough guys to have enough throws during the camp. And if someone gets hurt, they'll have to sign another quarterback. So remember, training camp is a mathematical problem, right? You only have so much time, two and a half hours, whatever, to be on the field. You only have so many reps, and you've got so many players you need to give the reps to. So the summer from Ju- June the 15th to July, you go to camp – it should be the head coach's job to figure out how many reps each player should get in the right position to get that player ready to go. Does, it still sounds a little tricky, though, because you're talking about pitch counts and, and it's an elbow. And we know with, with throwing athletes, we see it a lot with pitchers in Major League Baseball, not to the same extent with quarterbacks in the NFL. But it, it's you know, I'm always a little queasy when I hear elbow and in, in the throwing arm for, for a quarterback here like. Is it going to just be status quo when we come back here, even though he's on the pitch count? Or or could we see a little bit of decline in Brock Purdy entering year two, which sounds crazy to say, but it's a pretty significant injury. Well, I think you'll probably see, you know, the look, his game is not about the velocity of his arm. His game's about touch, feel, rhythm, right? So yeah. uh, I think it'll probably won't be as strong as it was before he injured it, but eventually, gradually, it can go. I mean, like a lot of guys, they injure the ACL – they come back with a stronger ACL, and they they're actually feel better. So, you know, medical science is so far advanced. I would have said if this injury happened 20 years ago, probably Brock Purdy wouldn't keep playing. But the way it is now, he can, and I'm sure he'll get just as strong. But we'll need to see it on the field. You know, we'll need yeah. to see it on the field. I mean, he's going to have to prove it to people. If he doesn't play in the summer, right, and you're Mike Tomlin and you're opening up with him, Mike Tomlin's going to want to see him how far he could throw the ball. Mike Tomlin's going to go out in pregame warm-up and watch him. Mike Tomlin's going to really study where his what his arm length is because remember the arm strength of a quarterback determines what you defend on the field, right? If the quarterback's arm is like Mahomes, it makes you defend every blade of grass. That's a, that's a different story than if your quarterback's arm is you know like Mac Jones, which is going to be kind of in a tight window, or you know some other guys that don't really zing it like they need to do. It, it doesn't mean you're not a good player. It just means this is where you like to throw the football with the most accuracy. Do you think this wait and see just to see what he looks like is going to hold up any sort of potential Trey Lance trade? Do you think they would want to still just, all right, we want to make sure Purdy's all good to go. And then once we check that box, we could explore maybe moving on from Trey Lance. Well, I mean, they've started the Trey Lance PR campaign already, you know, because he's yeah. buzzed light years ahead of everybody. You know, yeah. and he's feeling good. It's the first time he's really been able to. He's throwing motion is better. He's been working with, it's compact, the, you know, this quarterback coach. Well, I said, why wasn't he working with him before the draft? Like, I mean, it's just stupid. Until he plays well, I don't think they're going to have a market for him. You know, I think the thing we, we, we don't do a good enough job of as fans 
and as people that cover the sport, is giving players an opportunity to improve, right? Mm -hmm. You know, what we see early is maybe not what we get later, and then we're shocked when the player improves. You know, player development is one of the most crucial elements of any sport, right? How are we developing talent? I mean, Caleb Martin's a free agent. He ends up playing really well for the for the Heat. You know, you get these guys in the NBA. Well, you can't, you know, the NBA, according to the, the, the his hanky, hanky document, you can't get good players unless you pick high. Austin Reeves, you know, doesn't get drafted. He's one of the best players on the Lakers. So it's like player development matters, right? Player development is so important. And the teams that really do a good job of it in the offseason, those are the teams that improve, not because you sign some free agent. Yeah, I think Geno Smith is a really good example of that. Think about how things went with the New York Jets. And he yeah. was in a situation where he was going to be a career backup. And then last season wins comeback player of the year, leads the Seahawks to the playoffs. Yeah, I, I mean, look, Deion Lewis got cut by Cleveland. You know, Deion Lewis got traded for a lot as uh, Acho, who's on TV now. You know, and we traded for him. And then he got cut. The Kyle Shanahan and the boys, when I left, they cut him. He was out of football for a whole year. We pick him up in New England. He's probably one of our best players when he when he was healthy. So, yeah. like, this happens all the time. It's like, it's so, the NFL is so about what, what can you do today as opposed to who's doing a really good job of player development. Like, whose draft from 22 is impacting the 23 team? That's really what the most, that's the offseason. We got to get this player better. We got to get that player better. Well, as teams are starting to improve and make those guys better, we'll see what happens with Trey Lance, the 49ers quarterback situation. Sam Darnold is out there as a potential insurance policy as well. The, there, in there's case another of example. Da yeah. Darnold wasn't – Darnold – look, you can hate Darnold all you want. Darnold actually was better in Carolina than he was at the Jets. He'll get, he'll be, he's in a system of offense that will enhance his talent, and it will help him. Will he make mistakes? I'm sure he probably will, but he's not a complete – you can't put him on the field. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, and I always go back to like, everybody thought this guy was talented at one time or another. And that doesn't mean like, like it doesn't matter where you're drafted. It matters how you play, but uh, he's not just like some scrub of a player or anything like that. Like if, if in the right situation, he could be productive as we saw last year in Carolina where they almost won the division, you know, it does it was with a losing record, but they still almost won the division and almost made the playoffs and could have beat Tampa Bay, but things kind of fell short for them. Let's transition over to what's going on with Los Angeles Chargers running back Austin Eckler. This is a player that we've talked about a lot here on the podcast because I know, Michael, you're really high on him because of the the not the potential that he has, but the the capabilities that he has in the passing game in addition to what he also does in the running game, being kind of a weapon out of the backfield. Well, he recently agreed to a revised contract with the Chargers because Eckler wanted more money or he wanted to be traded. That was the discussion out of L.A. Well, now he has a $1.7 million added in incentives to where he can receive $1 million for total yards or up to 600000 for touchdowns if he gets to 10 to 16 touchdowns and then more money if he makes the Pro Bowl here. Is this kind of of the amicable like just like all right like let's come together because we couldn't find a trade partner and we were never going to pay you the big contract that you wanted well i think it's the, you know it's the it's the lesser of two evils right i don't want to hold out and get fined and yeah. you know so i'll take whatever you're going to give me and then you know they didn't put in that they won't franchise him, so he could still be a franchise player i mean you talk about an off season now this is the the, the charges are the perfect example of you know, they've signed one player this offseason in Eric Kendricks, and then they have their draft picks, right? They draft Quentin Johnson. They draft, you know, they draft uh, uh, the uh, Tulopu, the linebacker in the mm -hmm. second round. But they, their job is, their, their whole belief of their team is if we just got to get these players to stay healthy, A, and B, get them to play better. Now, you know, you could say, well, how's that going to work? I don't know. But, you know, they've got to get Slater to stay healthy. They've got to get Lindsey to stay healthy. You know, they've got to get Bosa to stay healthy. They've got to get Khalil Mack to play at the same level he did before. So the, if their player development isn't good, the Chargers will fall apart. But the Chargers have to. But had, keeping Eckler happy, I mean, it was just a situation of, look, I've got to take what the crumbs they're going to throw me because I really don't have any options here. Yeah, and that running back market is not looking really good just based on what the guys have been getting out there. Saquon Barkley still has his uh, franchise tag that he has not yet signed, so he wouldn't be fined for any sort of missed um, OTAs or training camp if it even drags into the summer. But it's tough out there for a running back to get that money. And if you're Eckler, I guess you kind of have to 
swallow your pride a little bit and just say, all right, I'll take this money and hopefully I can hit these incentives and then we'll try to do this dance again next year. But I mean, I feel for yeah, those guys, I mean, man, at that position. I do too. But I mean, like if you're the Chargers, if I'm Tom Telesco and I look at my backfield, I make Eckler better if I had a better, if I had another back with Eckler. If I had Lamont, if I had a big thumper, another back to go with Eckler, I would be make the team. And I, I'm not sure it's it's Joshua Kelly. I'm not sure it's Isaiah Spiller, you know, or Roundtree. I'm not sure it's any of those guys. But to me, one of the things they need on their team is a is a banger, somebody that can make Eckler a better player. And I don't think they have that. I don't think they fix that issue. Yeah, it's like you want to have that Ingram to the Camara type of thing, like the 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 the, the power yeah, exactly. back who can help the the guy and who's kind of more of the out of the backfield guy like Eckler is, who's a talented player, is going to score a lot of touchdowns because he always does as long as he stays healthy. It, it's interesting because you see Eckler's situation, but this has been coming to a head quite a bit here for running backs because. Our old buddy Le'Veon Bell, who has been recently kind of been <laughs> retired from the NFL. I don't know if he's. Re- I don't think he's officially retired, but the league retired him. He had the famous dispute with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Didn't want to play on the franchise tag. Held out the entire season, then signed with the New York Jets. It went like a disaster with the New York Jets there. But he recently said that he wishes that he could have that redo, that he could not be as petty in his exit from Pittsburgh. I mean, it's not really a surprise based on how the rest of his career went after he left the Steelers. Do you know how many people on the worldwide leader were defending him for walking away from that money? Do you know how many people actually he had it that were in his court that said this is a smart thing to do? I mean, it's really kind of I, I was ripping him the whole time. I think Tate Frazier and I were ripping him like crazy. Like, it was the dumbest thing I ever heard of. Like, you're gonna pass away money? You're gonna give up a whole year of earning power? Oh no, he'll yeah. make it up in his next contract. How do you make up money you lost? It isn't they're gonna yeah. pay you fourteen million above what they're gonna give you. If you take the $14 million and you become a free agent, you're getting that contract with the Jets anyway. So how do you make it up? It made no sense at all. It was the dumbest thing of all. You feel bad for the kid because, you know, yeah. this, is, this is the time and place where you have to make the money. Yeah. It, it, it was a, a year of his prime that he just gave up. And he was training on his own in South Florida, doing whatever he was doing. But and this is the exact quote that he gave. He said this on the podcast, the Steel Here podcast. He said, yeah, it was a little petty, the little guarantee stuff. I'm thinking like, damn, could I have really just ate it? Yeah, I probably could have. Probably could have really ate it. And he hopes that he could sign with the Steelers, get a couple of carries in the preseason, and be able to retire as a Pittsburgh Steeler. I'm not sure if they would be able to – you know, amend those fences because it got a little messy there. But man, I, it, it, you do feel bad for him just as like, like you just either got some bad advice or were just too prideful and too stubborn. And that's probably not the position to do it. No, I mean, you only have so many years to earn money. It's not a hard yeah. problem. You know, you're a running back. You have X amount of years. Don't walk away from him. I mean, Eckler did a smart thing. He wasn't going to, he knew he had no option. Compare the Eckler case to Bell. Eckler, say Eckler holds out all year. They told his contract he's going to come back and play. You know, the yeah. one thing the collective bargaining agreement did is give, play, give the teams rights with players who aren't happy with their contracts. Now, players have these sit-ins, which the teams tolerate. I don't know why, but they do. But they have these sit-ins. But at the end of the day, you've got to be able to either you play or you don't. Either you play or you don't. Yeah. I forgot about those sit-ins. Those th- it's going to start coming up again. Like guys, all of a sudden, hey, he's got a sore hamstring. He can't really get out there. <laughs> it's, and, and you can avoid getting fined. It's it's a nice little loophole well, it goes to go against ahead the team. and have a hold it. it, it, yeah. it again, it, if you got a sit-in, it basically goes against the team. It's it's the I versus we. You know, it's yeah. like how do we bond a team when we got a guy sitting in? Yeah. Remember, it, you know, building a football team is, I've said before, it, it, it is a spiritual challenge. And, and spiritual meaning that it takes you to give up yourself for the betterment of the team. And it's also a, a basically a communion of people coming together. So if, if you got to sit in, you, don't, you miss that whole thing. If you were running a team today, like, would you just say, hey, we're not going to have contract negotiations in training camp? Like, would you try to get all that stuff done before training camp? Because, like, let's say in the case of the 49ers who we were just talking about with Brock Purdy, Nick Bosa is eligible for a contract extension. He's coming off being defensive player of the year. Why drag it into training camp where maybe, let's say, to start training camp, Bosa says, well, I'll just be on the side. I'm going to be here and be here for my teammates on the sidelines, but I'm not going to do any activities until I get my money. 
Well, because what's the only way you get money is with deadlines. If you let yeah. a player sit in, you've get you've basically given all the leverage to the player. There's no deadline. There's no deadline. He could just sit there. You know, like if you don't look, I would I would easily like I, if you don't if we can't come to an agreement by here, you know, then you can come in. You're gonna come in here, but we got to talk about it later. You got to put deadlines on contract talks. Mm-hmm. Now, if you're getting closer to it, you understand it, yeah. But you, you know, you can't make golden rules about anything today because you know teams are firing players whose contracts. But I think you got to find a way to to kind of mediate this situation as for the good of the team, not for the good of the player. Yeah, I mean, T.J. Watt had a. Uh, had one of those hold-ins a, f- a few years ago where it really went all the way up to, I think, the week of week one, I want to say. And he didn't really do much in training camp. But then, I mean, he's TJ he was really good and ended up winning Defensive Player of the Year. But, yeah, it's the this, the hold-ins is kind of the new thing to do because you don't get fined and you can somehow – uh, I guess reserve your 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 um, your services there from the team, and just wait to get the money that you want. So we'll see if it happens once again here this upcoming training camp. We're still ways away from training camp, about six weeks or so, but it's coming up quickly, and we're we're excited for it. But that does it for this edition of the podcast. We'll be back on Thursday with a fun fun interview. Luke Russert will be joining us Thursday. Look out Buffalo for that Bill one. It's part of our literature and leadership. Huge Big huge Bills. Buffalo Bill fan. We'll be yep. circling the wagons on Thursday. <laughs> Big Bills Mafia episode there. So we'll see how he's feeling. Because it feels like a lot of people are kind of down on the Bills. I feel like they don't get talked about as much anymore. But they're still a pretty good team, in my opinion, there. And they'll have because some sort of say any, on They who. didn't sign a marquee free agent. That, that yeah. We're not accounting for them to improve the players that they have. I think that's the, the key thing. Yeah, well, we'll talk to Luke Russert on Thursday. Hopefully you guys join us then. As always, make sure to subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Thank you to our producer, Elliot Bowman, with us on the ones and twos. Thank you to DraftKings. Thank you to VEASAN. And thank you to you, Michael. Have a good rest of the extended weekend, and I will talk to you on Thursday. Thanks, Femi. 